Hello. My name is Harry Von Zell. I'm an American citizen of Austrian descent. I was born in the Midwestern state of Indiana a good many years ago. Seems a long time to me. But I wonder how many of you are like me. Now, I've always felt that I've met my responsibilities as an American citizen rather well. And yet, honest contemplation of the past and the present forces me to confess that there may have been some things that I've overlooked, as perhaps of you. It must be quite apparent by this time to any thinking individual that the people of our country and people of other countries all over the world are coming to face a moment of grave decision, a time when we will choose the course of our future. The choice lies between two opposing ideologies. On the one side, socialist communism, vesting total power over the individual within the state. On the other side, democratic capitalism, advocating a people's government and granting to the individual certain rights and freedoms, freedom of thought, of speech, freedom of worship, the right of free enterprise, free assembly, and many other rights and freedoms. Now, it would seem inconceivable to me that any thinking person would voluntarily choose socialist communism inasmuch as in so doing, he divests himself of all individual rights and subjects himself completely to the dictates and the will of whatever individuals may be in control of the state from time to time. To me, that's like signing a blank check and handing it to a stranger without any right of cancellation should it fall into the wrong hands. And yet in just a few short years, the proponents of socialist communism have succeeded in bringing under their influence or control nearly 40% of the world's people. How has this been accomplished? It's with the fervent hope that together we might find an answer to that question that I ask you to remain with us here for a little while to look, to listen, and to think. You are watching a student riot in Caracas, Venezuela, protesting the visit of a vice president of the United States. This mob was incited and led by known communists. Moscow to Montevideo. This communist-led student riot in Montevideo, Uruguay, is protesting the visit of a president of the United States. Moscow to Tokyo. Japanese students rioting in Tokyo, inflamed and led by communists, protesting the Japanese-American peace treaty. Moscow to San Francisco. These are American students in San Francisco, led by known communists. They are protesting the House Committee on Un-American Activities. This crisis for Americans is vividly highlighted by the communist accent on youth. May I present our program moderator, Mr. William J. Teague, Vice President of Pepperdine College of Los Angeles. Ladies and gentlemen, this series, Crisis for Americans, is dedicated to you and to the freedoms for which our country stands. This is not a propaganda program. What we show you is based upon facts presented by governmental agencies. These facts, closely studied and analyzed, present a clear pattern upon which the masterminds of Soviet socialist communism build their case for dividing and conquering the world. The youthful mind, eager, quickly stimulated, and idealistically imaginative, is vulnerable to these things. In many cases, the responses are completely emotional rather than intellectual. The result, such demonstrations, as we have just witnessed. 
Let's look further and see how the communist sees every opportunity to achieve their goals. The slaying of Patrice Lumumba set off more communist incited student riots like this in Cairo, Egypt. At a Kremlin reception for supposed non-communist neutral Premier Nasser, Khrushchev stated, quote, We are willing to do everything in order to further the complete liberation of colonial and dependent countries, unquote. Moscow to Belgrade. In Tito's supposed non-Soviet communist neutral Yugoslavia, this student riot, and Khrushchev said, quote, in this world today, there is a fierce struggle of two ideologies, the socialist and the bourgeois. And in this struggle, there can be no neutrals. Moscow to Paris. Here, another communist incited student riot, and Khrushchev declared, quote, we do not want war, but we do not renounce class warfare. Moscow to Cuba, another proud accomplishment of communism. In Stalin's words, quote, Lenin never regarded the Republic of Soviets as an end in itself. To him, it was always a link needed to facilitate the victory of the working people of the world over capitalism. Moscow to New York. The United Nations, this happened. Why? Let us ponder the words of Lenin, one of the founders of communism, quote, it is possible to conquer the more powerful enemy by skillfully taking advantage of every antagonism between the various groups or types, by taking advantage of every opportunity of gaining a mass ally. Those who do not understand this fail to understand even a grain of Marxism. Youth will decide the issue of the entire struggle, both student youth and still more the working class youth. A further enlightening statement of Lenin's is, quote, in our struggle for world domination, America will fall like a ripe plum without a shot being fired. These are the teachings of Lenin, quote, at the basis of communist morality lies the struggle for the consolidation and consummation of communism. That also is the basis of communist training, education, and tuition. Stalin, furthering the Marxist-Lenin world domination theme, reminded the communist youth of the world, and I quote, an internationalist is he who is ready to defend the USSR, because the USSR is the base of the world revolutionary movement, unquote. Here is another quote from Stalin, quote, a revolution which has been victorious in one country must regard itself as a means for hastening the victory of the proletariat in all countries. Khrushchev is doing all he can to bury us and achieve in his time the communist world domination goal. On March 21st, 1961, Mr. K told the Soviet people, quote, we shall be happy when the people of all countries stand under the banner of Marxism-Leninism and the communist banner shall fly over the whole planet, unquote. His militant ally, Chinese communist Mao Zedong, is quoted in the official Peking People's Daily as saying that coexistence with capitalism is impossible and that warfare with those forces is inevitable. It would appear that whether hot or cold, the war against our society continues unrelenting. Khrushchev's happiness depends upon the political theory that the present form of government in the United States should be changed by force, violence, and other unconstitutional means to a totalitarian form of government where we have a dictatorship. This is what Khrushchev advocates for us and our grandchildren. One party government. People ruled by dictators and bureaus and not responsible to the people. Controlled by a police state. Wages and prices fixed by the state. Workers told where to work all means of production owned by the state. The same true of all forms of communication. And worse, the state controls education. 
confessions of people accused of crimes obtained by pressure. Let's see how happy the people really are who already live under the banner of Marxism-Leninism. Here you see 50,000 East Berliners led by their youth demonstrating for the right of self-determination. When the communist puppet regime calls for Soviet tanks, the people are enraged. A communist red flag goes up in flames. Russian signs are demolished. Soviet uniforms being tossed to the crowd are torn to shreds. It would seem to belie Mr. K's confident words, quote, the Germans in East Germany do not wish to return to the old way of life, end quote. These insurgents have no arms. They throw stones and use sticks against the Soviet tanks. The crowd unleashes its fury on red sympathizers and fellow travelers among them. East Germans will never forget their one day of freedom, June 17, 1953. The East Germans were fighting for the right to live in a free republic such as ours, where, in a republic, there is no limit on the number of political parties or candidates for office, where the people are free to differ from the party in power and vote for other candidates, where people are governed by officials responsible to the people, and where wages are determined by individual or collective bargaining. And we have the freedom to choose our own jobs. Where the people own the means of production. Where we enjoy free press, free speech, freedom of religion. Where we have local control of education. And where the courts safeguard personal liberties and private property. Many references have been made to the fact that some Americans, especially young people, may be taking their freedoms for granted. To comment on this alleged apathy, we have invited a top expert on communism, Dr. Strauss Huppé, who is director of Foreign Policy Research Institute at the University of Pennsylvania and professor of political science. Professor Huppé. Thank you, Mr. Teague. Of course, students should be encouraged to learn more about national and international affairs. I'm not sure that students as a group are more apathetic about international affairs as are other groups of our population. Perhaps one of the main reasons for their interest not being as consistent as it might be is the lack of clearly stated foreign policy objectives. This does not apply to students alone. It applies to every one of us. If we know upon what to focus, then indeed we can study what we need to study. But in the absence of clearly stated objectives, it is very difficult to see exactly where we should begin. Now, to be sure, students ought to study more. Yet in order to study, they must have available the necessary materials. There are many good books, many interesting articles, which tell us what communist objectives are, what the communists want to achieve in the world, what their strategy and their tactics are. Now these books, of course, must be available to the students and they must be made available by the appropriate teachers. This is a very complex process and I cannot see any shortcuts to remedying the alleged apathy of the American student. To help you get the information Professor Huppé mentioned, may we suggest your public library as a source of hundreds of books, magazine articles, pamphlets, newspapers, and audiovisual material on communism. Here are just a few. Masters of Deceit by J. Edgar Hoover, an excellent book on anti-communism. The Naked Communist by W. Cleon Skousen, formerly of the FBI. And The New Class by Mila Von Gilis, a former official of the Tito regime of Yugoslavia. You can also get these books and materials at independent bookstores, as we did. Now let's take a look at some material written by top communists. Cuba, Hope of a Hemisphere by Joseph North, publication by International Publishers. 
North is foreign editor of the Communist Party's newspaper, The Worker. Disarmament and the American Economy by Hyman Loomer. Publication by New Century Publishers. Loomer is educational secretary of the Communist Party USA. And Campus Rebels by Al Richmond, executive editor of The People's World, the Communist Party's West Coast publication. In Campus Rebels, Richmond presents the case for the students involved in the San Francisco riots, 1960. Pertinent to this student incident are these two U.S. government publications, report by the Committee on Un-American Activities and Communist Target Youth by J. Edgar Hoover. In this report, Mr. Hoover states, the plans for the format of New Horizons reveal the nature of the trap communists are setting for our campus students. Rubin pointed out to the party's National Executive Committee that New Horizons will not be labeled a Marxist publication. The purpose of this is to avoid too close identification with the Communist Party. But it will, he said, give a Marxist analysis of the youth movement and a socialist outlook. He expressed the conviction that it would be extremely effective in closing the gap between what he termed democratic youth and youth on the left. Mr. Hoover declares, particularly unfortunate is the fact that many youth and student groups in the nation today are totally unaware of the extent to which the communist can victimize and exploit them. Communist target youth and the 1960 annual report by the Committee on Un-American Activities are two of the many pamphlets you can get from your government printing office. Material from this official list of publications relating to various aspects of communism are for sale at a very nominal cost by the Superintendent of Documents, U.S. Government Printing Office, Washington 25, D.C. Typical of other booklets is Guide to Subversive Organizations and Publications. Presently being revised, it is helpful in identifying communist and communist front organizations. For another aspect of the communist accent on youth, J. Edgar Hoover in his Communist Target Youth says, The communist lures to subvert youth of other countries are tempting and varied. There are, for instance, the World Youth Festivals, which have been held every other year since 1947. The seventh such affair, held in Vienna, 1959, attracted thousands of young people from America, Africa, and Asia, as well as those from the Soviet satellite countries. Referring to communist youth, Hoover goes on to say, quote, from their earliest days, these young people must learn to accept the course dictated for them by the almighty state, unquote. Khrushchev bears this out in a speech at the 40th anniversary of the Komsomol Young Communist League, quoting Khrushchev. Young people often wonder what a person in communist society should be like. This can be answered briefly. He should be a true Leninist. One is born in a socialist society, and one lives first of all for the community. Therefore, private affairs, thoughts, and deeds must be subordinated. In this communist-sponsored rally, youth is gathered from all over the globe. In contrast to the rigid control the Russians exercise over their students and youth, ours enjoy liberty and freedom of thought, freedom of choice, and freedom of self-determination. What do our students really know about the basic freedoms and opportunities of the American way of life? For a shocking report on how we look to our enemy, here is Dr. William E. Mayer, major in the United States Army, foremost authority on communist brainwashing and a top psychiatrist. I'm going to read excerpts of a report which is an evaluation of the nature of the average American soldier as seen by the chief of intelligence of the Chinese People's Volunteer Army in North Korea several years ago. I quote, Based upon our observations of American soldiers and their officers, captured in this war for the liberation of Korea from capitalist imperialist aggression, the following facts are evident. There is little knowledge or understanding, even among U.S. university graduates, of American political history or philosophy, the federal, state, and community organization, states and civil rights, freedoms, safeguards, checks and balances, and how these things allegedly operate within his own system. The American is insular and provincial. 
with little or no idea of the problems and the aims of what he contemptuously describes as foreigners and their countries. The American soldier has weak loyalties to his family, his community, his country, his religion, and to his fellow soldier. His concepts of right and wrong are hazy and ill-formed. Opportunism is easy for him. By himself, he feels frightened and insecure. He underestimates his own worth, his own strength, and his ability to survive. He is ignorant of social values, social tensions, and conflicts. That's the end of the quotation. There are several important things that should be remembered about this document. To begin with, it was written by communists. It reflects their point of view. It was not written as propaganda, but as a guide for those people who were going to operate prisoner of war camps in North Korea. The studies were of soldiers under the worst possible conditions of malnutrition and danger. Now, we have studied in the armed forces ever since that time the nature of the American soldier and ways to improve his quality. And we've come a long way. Recent research in the past year has indicated that the average American fighting man is today more concerned with his duties and responsibilities, both as a soldier and as a citizen, and is better informed about communism than ever before. However, the document still has a certain amount of meaning and importance for Americans. It can serve as a kind of checklist that we can use ourselves. By seeing what it is the communists feel are our greatest vulnerabilities, the big chinks and cracks in our moral armor, we can determine or attempt to whether our family structure today, whether our school system, our churches, the activities of our communities are actually building in to young Americans long before they reach military age, are building in those attributes of a sense of deep personal responsibility, not leaving things to somebody else or to the government to take care of for them. Whether our society is building in to our youngsters a genuine deep understanding of the philosophical basis for this society of free men, the moral basis upon which our country is founded and upon which the preservation of a society such as ours depends. Here is how the freedom and prosperity we enjoy came about. Private property, a natural human right. Private property in the United States guaranteed by the Constitution and laws. Private ownership of land and the means of production. The right to pay interest and dividends for the use of money in order to conduct a business. The right to sell legal stocks and bonds to finance business. People free to organize and conduct any legal business for profit. Our system stimulates initiative, industry, creativity, and independence and it develops the natural resources of the nation and ensures large production of goods and services and employment to many people. In the face of what we have to offer, how do communists gain control of non-communist governments? Let's take a look. By military occupation, by expelling non-communist officials, by the army appointing puppet officials, by obtaining military and police powers, controlling the legislative procedures, by propaganda creating political and economic unrest, controlling the courts, terrorizing political and economic opponents, by obtaining government positions and secrets. Khrushchev uttered these words, we respect all peoples and are in favor of each settling for itself which order is better for it. This is Budapest, Hungary, October 1956. 
university students are demonstrating their approval of Poland's successful defiance of the Soviet Union. Their ranks quickly swell with public support. They assemble in the tens of thousands to hear members of their writers' union oppose the Communist Party government leaders for oppressing freedom, distorting the truth, exploiting labor and abusing the farmers. The students demand an end to Soviet domination. They want their own flag without the Soviet emblem in it, the symbol of alien rule. Khrushchev had this to say, quote, the lesson of the events in Hungary where the counter-revolution used some writers for its filthy ends reminds us of what political carelessness can lead to in relation to the intrigues of the forces hostile to socialism, unquote. The students post their own program of 16 points, including a demand for a new government to resist Soviet oppression. They march to the Budapest radio station to make their program known to the nation and to the world. Their delegates are arrested. The angry crowd refuses to disperse until their student leaders are free and defied the communist security police open fire with machine guns, not water hoses. Freedom fighters rally to fight the Soviet tanks moving in during the night. Khrushchev said, we had force in our hands and the truth was on our side. Our truth is the truth of the workers. We were faced with the question, what to do? Reason urged that we help the workers and the working class of the Hungarian People's Republic. Comrades believed me that it was difficult for us to make a decision. But we considered that we could not remain indifferent spectators when emboldened fascist elements embarked on bestial outrages against workers, peasants, communists, and others of the best representatives of the working class of Hungary." Unquote. Translation, Russians go home. These are Molotov cocktails, a homemade concoction of Russian recipe. They prove most effective against the Soviet tanks. The Russian drive bogs down. The Soviets are forced to lift the siege of the Kilian barracks, where a hastily organized defense under Colonel Paul Molitor has withstood a violent assault. The inscription reads, Free Hungarian Radio. A free press rolls. Cardinal Minzenti, imprisoned for eight years, sees the light of a great day. We quote Khrushchev, you think that the communist system in this or that country can be maintained only with the help of our armed forces? I would not fight for such a communist system. The communist system must be based on the will of the people. And if the people do not wish this system, let them establish the way of life they prefer best." Unquote. The Soviets start to evacuate themselves from the city and go to great lengths to convince the Hungarian populace that they're getting out for good. Hungarians make a holiday out of seeing the families of Soviet officials leaving the city bag and baggage. Hungarian army soldiers and freedom fighters rejoice in their victory. Here is Janusz Savo, one of the citizen heroes to emerge from the revolution. Minister of State of the new government, Kilde, and Molitor, now a major general, are invited to the headquarters of the Soviet High Command to discuss the withdrawal of the Soviet troops. It's a trap. Molitor is never to return, and the Hungarian army in Budapest is left without a commander. Now Soviet bombers signal the beginning of a crushing tank assault on the city, backed by big guns. Khrushchev explained, quote, We are convinced that the Hungarian working class will never give the counter-revolution an opportunity to raise its head. We must warn amateurs against all kinds of provocations. The Soviet Union is always ready to come to the aid of its friends and resist the enemies of socialism. It is well known that in their attempts to undermine the foundations of the people's democratic system, the enemies of socialism were relying on the young people, trying to deceive them with false slogans and to deflect them from the correct path. In connection with this, we must constantly increase our vigilance and pay more attention to the correct upbringing of young people. Three months following tributes paid him as a hero of the revolution, Patriot Janos Savos was hanged. 
from its inception, communism has sought to beguile, to deceive, to ensnare, and to employ others to unwittingly serve its goal of worldwide domination. The idealism of youth has been misused to bring about social upheaval and political chaos. Communism is not interested in healing any breach or resolving any schism. Rather, it agitates, foments, and exploits human problems. Of course, in America, we have the freedom to dissent and to criticize existing policies so long as we follow legal processes. This freedom of speech and expression is a precious part of our free society. We must not carelessly use this freedom, thus weakening or destroying the system that makes it possible. The most powerful evidence of the unparalleled advantages and values of our American system is the freedom it allows its own critics. Let's keep it. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our purpose, I believe, is quite clear. It is to seek a greater awareness among us of the true nature and the true goals of those forces we oppose. To clarify and to reveal the methods by which they would hope to further those goals. As I said at the beginning of this subject, I believe the time of choice is imminent. No one can deny you the right to choose that which you want for yourself, for your children, and for your grandchildren. We ask only that you inform yourself as completely as possible, so that if and when you make your decision, you do so with the full realization of what it portends. Thank you.